May I have your attention, please? For your safety, please note the locations of emergency exits. They are identified with illuminated signs and located to either side of the stage and at the rear of the theater in both the orchestra and balcony sections. In the event that an alarm sounds, please exit immediately and calmly as directed by staff and ushers. An automated external defibrillator, or AED, is located on the wall in the lobby adjacent to the box office. State law prohibits smoking and the display of open flame. Thank you for your attention. The program will begin momentarily. Please be seated. Thank you, George. Good afternoon. Welcome. I'm Clayton Rose, the president of the college, and it is uh, wonderful to be with you this afternoon. This is one of the great moments uh, in the life of our college, and it is one of my great privileges to be able to preside over these exercises, which we hold annually to recognize outstanding academic accomplishment by our students. And why do we do this? We do it because Bowdoin is a college where we place a premium on intellectual excellence. And the accolades that we offer today are not easily earned. Ours is a rigorous academic program with standards of excellence that are challenging and with expectations set by our faculty that are difficult to meet. And the outstanding level of achievement demonstrated by these students requires intense focus, a deep pride in one's work, and a passion for learning, and it warrants our full appreciation and the congratulations that we offer today. Our recognition of Bowdoin Scholars goes back to 1941. In those days, the students were all men, and this honor was then named exclusively for James Bowdoin III. In 1997, some might suggest 
perhaps a tad late, the college decided it was appropriate to reestablish her tradition in the name of James and Sarah Bowden. And she was an active partner in creating this college with her husband. The Honorable James Bowden III lived from 1752 until 1811. And he was a son, as you might expect, of James Bowden II, for whom the college is named. James II was a political and intellectual leader during the Revolutionary War, twice elected the governor of Massachusetts, a successful entrepreneur, and a member of the Boston and Massachusetts business elite. And in those days, Maine was a district of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He was also a man with profound interest in learning, along with John Adams, John Hancock, and others. He founded the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And visitors to Boston can find Governor Bowdoin's grave in the granary uh, burying ground on Tremont Street, close to where Hancock and Samuel Adams are also buried. And it was Samuel Adams who, as governor of Massachusetts, signed the charter in 1794 that established Bowdoin College. Governor Bowdoin's son, James III, was one of our country's first connoisseurs of American and European culture and politics. He was a diplomat, an agriculturalist, and a collector who acquired a substantial library, a significant art collection, and an impressive array of scientific instruments of which we at the college are the inheritors. And he also provided the land and the funds to establish Bowdoin College. Sarah Bowdoin traveled to London and Paris from 1805 to 1808 with her husband as he served President Thomas Jefferson. The Bowdens operated out of Paris. Sarah kept a journal, which is in our special collections area here today, which documented the daily life of the family. And it appeared they both flourished in Europe entertaining Americans living in Paris and important friends of our country. Sarah's journal indicates that she was very much involved in the collecting activities of the couple, and we therefore also owe her a deep gratitude of debt for the treasures that we have inherited at this college. And today, we remember the Bowdoin family through this annual event and through two other traditions. The Gilbert Stewart portraits of James and Sarah Bowden in our Museum of Art are decorated today with Laurel Garland. And it is on this day, too, that we also replaced a large American flag that flies on our quad with a smaller flag that flew over the US Capitol on August 7, 1963, to commemorate the birth of Massachusetts Governor James Bowden II. So thank you for joining us here this afternoon to remember Bowden's history and to congratulate our students for their impressive accomplishments. It is now my great pleasure to introduce this year's Sarah and James Bowden Day speaker student speaker, Caitlin Loy, class of 2020. An economics and education coordinate major and a math minor. Caitlin grew up overseas in Romania, South Africa, Beijing, and Singapore. By the age of 16, she had traveled to every continent but the Antarctica. Caitlin says her itinerant childhood gave her a new perspective on the notion of home, which she associates much more with people than place. An accomplished athlete, Caitlin is a bit of an unusual case. After swimming competitively for 10 years, she walked onto the cross-country team here at Bowdoin and fell in love with running. And she says that in doing so, she realized that the value of pursuing what truly makes her happy and says joining the cross-country team has boasted, boosted her confidence to step out of her comfort zone, which is exactly what we want here at Bowdoin. Her courage to push beyond the familiar and the comfortable has manifested itself in other areas of her life as well. After taking a two-year hiatus from math, Caitlin dove into linear algebra last year, which she calls the most memorable academic experience thus far. She says she lived with her textbook all semester, and after a grueling all-nighter of a take-home final exam, she emerged at dawn to celebrate and reflect on her achievement, which she describes as powering through a class in search of genuine understanding. Please join me in welcoming Caitlin Loy. Thank you, President Rose, for that introduction. It's true, I did emerge at dawn and I went to Giant Steps to watch the sunrise. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and congratulations to my fellow classmates on your outstanding academic achievements this past school year. I feel so fortunate to attend a school with such interesting, passionate, and intelligent people. You are all crucial to the construction of Bowdoin's motivating and intellectually curious environment. I want everyone here to answer this. What did you want to be when you were seven? 
A firefighter? An actor? A detective? I wanted to be an astronaut. In elementary school, I purchased scientific encyclopedias at book fairs, asked Santa for a telescope, and even went to a week-long Cornell space camp. Unfortunately, my astronautical dreams died when my family took a trip to Epcot, and I took part in the Journey to Mars expedition. <laughs> I was so motion sick afterwards that I could not even fathom attempting to travel to space. <laughs> but back to the dreams of your seven-year-old self. Are they still there? I hope they are. I hope you still indulge in those innocent curiosities. I hope you know that you still can. Years have passed since my astronaut days, and as I have gotten older, as we have gotten older, academic specialization has become reality. While this focus provides us the opportunity to dive deep into a subject of great interest, it also puts us at risk of academically pigeonholing ourselves. My inner economist knows that specialization makes for an efficient and prosperous economy. But within the scope of our small liberal arts college, specialization could have downsides. Natural curiosity doesn't deserve to be put by the wayside in favor of specialization. In order to adequately understand the world outside of the much adored Bowdoin bubble, it is necessary to challenge our own points of view and venture outside of our intellectual comfort zones. With zero experience, I leapt into an improv theater class my freshman year. I learned the value of saying yes and instead of but as an additive way to interact with another statement and am now a much better listener and conversationalist. There's lots to learn. Our departmental schooling should not keep us from enjoying a broad spectrum education. The gift of a liberal arts education is to serve as a launching pad to become a lifelong learner. Our education will not end when we hand in our honors projects, our culminating papers, our final take home exams. Our education will not end when we walk across that stage set up on the main quad with family and friends gazing proudly. Our education can continue for as long as we wish. The beauty of this world is that it is so vast, we will never be able to understand all of its illustrious secrets and mysteries in a single lifetime. Our opportunities to learn will never end, so long as we allow our curiosities and passions to lead us. In my education seminar, I recently read an article titled The Heart of a Teacher and stumbled upon this incredibly insightful point. When we listen primarily for what we ought to be doing with our lives, we may find ourselves hounded by external expectations that can distort our identity and integrity. What we ought to be doing may be pushed upon us by institutions, family members, or our peers. When we follow these ought to's, we risk ending up in a vocation not intended to be ours, one in which we don't feel fulfilled, no matter how externally valued it may be. These ought to's are some of the forces contributing to academic pigeonholing. My argument against succumbing to the pressures of these ought to's is to allow our curiosities and passions to take the wheel. It's cheesy, but by following your heart, you will not feel like you ought to be doing anything differently because you will already love what you are doing right now. You will enjoy your work and drill down deeper, learning endlessly. This semester, I am student teaching in a sixth grade math class at a middle school in Portland. When I'm, in my when I'm in my classroom, I am my happiest. On my first day, I taught two English language learners who weren't yet able to follow along with the class the concept of area. The smile I received from these students when they finally grasped the concept made me indescribably happy. On my second day, my mentor teacher set me free, and I fully taught two classes on the area of parallelograms. The energy I felt when calling on eagerly raised hands to offer thoughts is unparalleled. That energy and utter happiness in my heart is what I know I want to follow. And I cannot wait to spend many future years in a classroom. Because of my passion for education, I am driven to explore the benefits of culturally relevant pedagogy. I am driven to understand how to cultivate empathic joy in a classroom. I am driven to master techniques for effective instruction. 
By allowing my heart to lead the way, I will learn so much simply because I want to. I hope that everyone here will consider their true passions amongst their sea of ought tos. I want everyone to feel the same happy I feel when one of my students has a light bulb moment. My wish is for everyone's passion to drive them to keep learning and growing. At the same time, while the mathematician in me knows that a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, I think it is instructive to recognize that sometimes it is the meandering path that provides a richer experience, one full of interesting and unexpected perspectives. I do want to be a teacher, if that was not clear already, but I've accepted an offer to work at a Wall Street bank next year. It may sound like I'm giving up on my dream to teach for a career in corporate America, but I assure you this is most untrue. Yes, I was conflicted on the positive side my summer internship went well, I liked my job and my future colleagues, but I'd be lying if I told you that I didn't feel like it was the ought to that was the real force pushing me to accept that offer. As I contemplated the decision before me, I thought back to some of my best and most favorite teachers. I realized that many of them were special because they had helped connect academic subject matter to the real world in ways that made learning exciting and relevant. This led to some reflection. How can I possibly be a great teacher without an amalgam of experiences to motivate my lesson plans? A few years and my ought to will pay dividends, arming my math curriculum with examples steeped in reality. I also genuinely believe that presenting pitches and learning to engage with clients will help me perfect my teacher voice. I can simultaneously gain skills and knowledge applicable to my dream job as a math teacher in an environment seemingly opposite to that of a secondary school classroom. Hopefully, I'll leave Wall Street in a few years with an unmatched teacher voice and a bank, no pun intended, of real world math problems that will make any state test math question pale in comparison. And maybe also a bank account that will fund my master's in education. Approaching the remainder of my Bowdoin career and the years after in a way that is driven by my heart will prepare me to enter the real world with genuine energy, greater drive, and joy for my vocation. So today, I celebrate with you the academic achievement we have earned together and implore you to cultivate a mind that feels free to explore your slice of this vast world. The slice that makes you feel as giddy as a seven-year-old on a pre-astronaut path. But I also implore you to resist the temptation to make a beeline straight to your near-term goal. Be willing to take a winding route, one that may take a little longer, but perhaps one that will allow you to arrive at your destination a touch wiser and a little more seasoned. One line in our offer of the college is, to lose yourself in generous enthusiasms. Consciously make this choice to lose yourself, to dive in, to explore adjacent opportunities. When we all do that, we will thrive in our passions and continue to seek out learning opportunities for the rest of our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. That was fabulous, really well done. We were talking a little bit earlier when we were lining up outside about how you have to be willing to deal with uncertainty and know that the world is not going to lay it all out in front of you. And Caitlin certainly demonstrates that. Find my place here. So we begin this afternoon's recognition of our scholars with the presentation of the Allman Goodwin Prize. And I invite our recipients to come to the stage. So the Allman Goodwin Prize was established in 1906 by Mrs. Maud Wilder Goodwin in memory of her husband, Allman Goodwin, Bowdoin class of 1862. And the prize is commonly given to just one exemplary member of Phi Beta Kappa, but this year our award goes not to one, but as you can see, to four <laughs> remarkable Bowdoin students, and it is my pleasure to tell you a little bit about each one of them. Grace Caudry. Government and Legal Studies, 
neuroscience double major. Grace's interest in the area has influenced her decision to pursue an honors thesis about the opioid epidemic. And she's paying particular attention to how and why different states adopt various policy solutions to drug epidemics. Grace, who comes to us from Cincinnati, is a member of Bowdoin's mock trial team, which she says has helped her grow confident with public speaking and thinking on her feet. And she loves the role of playing an attorney, which she intends to become. Grace writes for the College Guild, is a student activities photographer, and loves distance running. Tori Clark. Double majoring in performance arts with a concentration in theater and in gender, sexuality, and women's studies. Philadelphia native. Tori's performed in every, uh, a show in every semester since she has uh, been at Bowdoin, both with the theater department and with student-led theater groups on campus. And she has said that these shows have been the most impactful experiences of her time at Bowdoin. Tori has also sung in the chamber choir, has been a member of the Bowdoin sketch comedy, led the first year orientation trips for the McKean Center, and has volunteered at a local high school as part of the Fostering Female Leadership in Youth program. She sent her, spent her spring of her junior year studying at Goldsmiths College in London and intends to pursue a career as an outdoor educator. Alana Haslam. <laughs> Math major, major and computer science minor. For her honors thesis, Alana's research in mathematics is about managing our ecosystem to be resilient in the face of a changing climate. A Maine native, Alana has sung with the chamber choir, is a co-leader of the Christian Student Association, and works as a quantitative reasoning tutor. She says her approach to academics and to solving problems has shifted while she has been at Bowdoin. So apparently there is some learning going on here, good news for all of us. Instead of looking at a problem set and panicking at the first sign of trouble, as she said she once did, although I'm not sure that really is true, she now expects a few days of confusion and instrumental, incremental understanding before the final aha comes along. And in this way, she has grown more comfortable thinking than doing as she works towards a solution. Alana says that after Bowdoin, she'll be pursuing a PhD in applied math. And Pauline Unitas, computer. computer science major and English minor from San Francisco. In her time at Bowdoin, Pauline has been president of the Bowdoin Queer Straight Alliance, an RA for Res Life, a TA for the computer science department, and a writing assistant. Because she didn't have enough to do, she's also learning Chinese and participated in an intensive summertime language program in Beijing. Pauline says that one of her most memorable academic experiences at the time she coded a peer-to-peer -peer file transfer system from scratch creating a communication system among 30 computers in 14 cities across the globe from Paris to Tokyo to Sao Paulo. She'll be returning to San Francisco after graduation to work as a technical writer for Salesforce. Please join me in congratulating all four of these tremendously talented and accomplished Bowdoin students. time. This fall, 12 students have been elected to Phi Beta Kappa, all of whom are members of the class of 2020. The Phi Beta Kappa Society, a national honorary society for the recognition and promotion of scholarship, was founded in 1776 at the College of William and Mary. The Bowdoin chapter was founded in 1825 and was the sixth in the line of establishment. Election is based primarily on academic achievement, but a student's full record is also taken into account. And the students elected to Phi Beta Kappa are expected to be persons of great integrity and moral character. If our students who have been elected to Phi Beta Kappa would, as I read each of your names, stand and remain standing until I have read all 12 names, and I would ask the audience to hold your applause until I am done. Rebecca L. Berman. Ah. 
Grace Caudry. Victoria J. Clark. Grace A. Fenwick. Lucia W. Gagliardin. Charlotte M. Hall. Isabel G. Houlet. Samuel A. Harder. Alana J. Haslam. Lori, Laura H. C. Howells. Tessa T. Peterson. And Pauline M. Unitas. Congratulations to all of you. A book bearing a replica of the early college book plate that distinguishes the James Bowden collection in our library is presented to every undergraduate who has carried a full course program and received a grade point average of 4.0 in their courses during the last academic year. This year, our first year recipients will receive The Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau. Second year recipients will receive Edward Hopper's Maine, which has been published by our own Museum of Art. And third year recipients will receive Confluence, Merry Meeting Bay by Franklin G. Burroughs, Bowdoin's Harrison King McCain Research Professor of the English Language Emeritus. And I now invite Dean McCormick to the stage to announce this year's recipients to come to the stage and receive their awards. Good afternoon. From the class of 2019, Acadia E. Mezzofanti. From the class of 2020, Grace Caudry. Ida F. Cortez. Diana K. Grandes. Pauline M. Unitas. Ian T. Ward. From the class of 2021, Brianna M. Cedrone. <laughs> Molly C. Eisner. Connor W. Fitch. <laughs> Katie J. Galetta. <laughs> In absentia, Emily R. King. Nicholas J. Lay. Also in absentia, Esther M. Lee. Mark W. Lucy. Keenan Murray. Audrey R. L. Ruman. Gavin T. Schilling.
Juliana C. Tobby. Colin M. Vanderveen. Annika F. Williams. Jason Jiang. From the class of 2022, Faraz A. Abud. Anthea L. Bell. Matthew J. Donnelly. John R. Hood. Isabel M. Crow. Grace M. Monahan. Emily Y. Pan. Julia E. Perillo. Caroline L. G. Poole. Kate E. Tapscott. Anthony Yanez. For a moment, I thought to myself, wait, where are the 23s? And then I remembered. So. Sarah and James Bowden scholars are recognized each year uh, each fall on the basis of the work completed in the previous academic year and the award is given to the 20% of all eligible students with the highest grade point average. This year we have 243 Sarah and James Bowden scholars and I'd like to ask those scholars present to stand so that we may recognize and applaud your remarkable work. I'd now like to invite Dean McCormick back to the podium to introduce today's faculty keynote speaker. Thank you, Clayton. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this afternoon. Salar Mohandesi is our assistant professor of history and he was selected by vote of our students to deliver today's keynote address, this fall's Karofsky Faculty Encore Lecture. The Karofsky Family Fund was established by Paul Karofsky, class of 1966, and his brother Peter Karofsky, class of 1962, and Paul's son, David Karofsky, class of 1993, in memory of their father and David's grandfather, Sidney B. Karofsky. The fund 
which has underwritten the Sidney B. Karofsky Prize for Junior Faculty, added the Karofsky Lecture in the spring of 2000. Professor Mohandesi grew up in Northern Virginia. He earned a Bachelor of Arts in History and Literary and Cultural Studies at the College of William and Mary, and obtained his PhD in History at the University of Pennsylvania. His research focuses on the transnational history of ideas, social movements, and political cultures in the wider context of war, revolution, and imperialism. At Bowdoin, he teaches courses on topics including fascism, the global, the global Cold War, the 1960s and 70s, and post-war Europe. His current book project, From Anti-Imperialism to Human Rights, traces the history of transnational anti-Vietnam War activism in France and the United States from the early 1960s to the late 1970s in order to explain how and why human rights displaced anti-imperialism as the dominant form of internationalism. Professor Mohandesi joined Bowdoin in 2017 as an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow, and in July of 2018, he was appointed assistant professor. His talk today, History After the End of History, reflects on the 30th anniversary of the collapse of the Berlin Wall and offers a new perspective. Please join me in welcoming Professor Salar Mohandesti. Thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, I would like to start by thanking President Rose, Dean McCormick, and all of my supportive colleagues for the opportunity to speak here today. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to all of my students. Thank you for your curiosity, contagious energy, and provocative insights these past couple of years. This talk is dedicated to you. This year marks the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, the great symbol of the emancipatory revolutions of 1989, a watershed in European history. What's fascinating about this anniversary is that more years have now passed since the wall's collapse than its actual existence. The wall was up for 28 years. In a few weeks, we will have lived a full 30 years without it. To put it differently, 1989 is further away from us in 2019 than Hitler's coming to power was for people living in the year 1961, which was when the wall was first built. We have clearly entered a new period of history, one that still has no name, and one that we are only now beginning to truly understand. In what follows, I want to share some of my thoughts about this strange new time in Europe, what I'm calling here history after the end of history. Don't worry, this uh, weird title will become clear soon enough. Exactly 30 years ago, in October 1989, the German Democratic Republic celebrated its 40th anniversary. Although the ruling Communist Party hoped to showcase the country's achievements, East Germany was in dire straits. The economy was insolvent, the ruling party had lost all legitimacy, and tens of thousands of Germans marched through the streets in protest, chanting, we are the people. The cycle of protest and repression, accommodation and rebellion, came to a head on November 9, 1989, when Gunter Schabowski, spokesperson for the ruling party, addressed a press conference. He had just received a note about relaxing travel restrictions and decided to read it out loud. A reporter asked, when does this take effect? Schabowski, who had missed crucial meetings earlier that day, was not sure, and so he hesitated then said, effective immediately. Another reporter asked the logical follow-up question. 
if Germans could in fact travel back and forth freely, then what did that mean for the future of the wall? Schabowski froze, then started rambling. All of this was caught live on TV. That night, tens of thousands of Germans raced to the wall, forcing their way to the other side. For many contemporaries, the fall of the wall marked not just the end of the GDR, but of the Cold War itself. After all, few things more poignantly symbolized the division of the world into two rival blocks than the literal partition of Germany into two countries, two competing models squaring off face to face. The collapse of East Germany seemed to be proof that the Soviets had lost and capitalism had won. Just a year later, Europeans witnessed another momentous event. In 1990, representatives from the two Germanys and the four powers that had occupied the country after World War II, that's the United States, Soviet Union, France, and Great Britain, met to settle Germany's fate. The four powers renounced all rights in the area, post-war borders were solidified, and East Germany would be absorbed into West Germany. After, 90, after, after 45 years, Germany finally returned to the world stage as a united country. This meeting represented another symbolic end. For many Europeans, the treaty not only paved the way to German reunification, it finally brought the Second World War in Europe to an end. Now, this might sound odd, but after World War II, there was in fact no official peace treaty. The confused conclusion to the war, which left Germany divided, prevented any formal end to the war, since there was no single, sovereign, internationally recognized Germany with which to sign a treaty. Only with the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany could the old allies finally come together to bring the most destructive war in human history to an end. As the famous French politician Simone Weil put it, la guerre est finie, the war is over. Then, in 1991, Europe experienced yet another surprise. In that year, a series of unexpected events led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union itself. On December 25th, 1991, Mikhail Gorbachev delivered his televised farewell speech. The red flag drooping above the Kremlin was lowered for the last time, and the Soviet leader retired to the Walnut Room for a drink with his closest aides. Around midnight, he departed the former president of a country that no longer existed. Once again, this event marked another symbolic endpoint for many Europeans. Gorbachev's resignation signaled not just the end of the Soviet Union, but of the socialist project itself. The disintegration of the USSR, home of the world's first successful socialist revolution, for decades the living alternative to capitalism, seemed to prove that socialism just didn't work. So in quick succession, we have the symbolic end of the Cold War in 1989, the end of the Second World War in 1990, and the end of socialism in Europe in 1991. Many contemporaries were convinced they were living through the end of an entire era. And if you read the commentaries from the time, they are suffused with this feeling of having experienced something truly world historic. One of these hot takes was eventually published as a book in 1992. In a volume called The End of History and the Last Man, the political theorist Francis Fukuyama argued that the incredible events of the last few years signaled not just the end of an era, but the end of history itself. Let me explain. In Fukuyama's view, history, in quotation marks, referred not simply to a litany of events, but to a competition between different visions of the future. With the end of the Cold War, the Second World War, and socialism, the intense ideological struggles of the past, the bloody wars between different social systems had been settled. One model of development, liberal capitalism, had clearly emerged victorious, bringing history itself to a close. 
Of course, Fukuyama insisted that things would continue to happen, that there would still be challenges ahead, but he argued that these would all be resolved within the framework of liberal capitalism. Instead of ideological strife, the future would bring the progressive expansion of the only successful social system in human history. He predicted that more and more countries across the world would gradually come to embrace Western-style representative democracy, civil liberties, free market capitalism. In a certain sense, he wasn't wrong. Rival ideologies did seem defeated, and especially now that fascism was discredited and socialism exhausted. Capitalism did seem triumphant as the free market extended across Eastern Europe. And democracy did seem universal as dictatorships fell like dominoes. In fact, for the first time in modern history, nearly all European countries began to converge on the same model, representative governments, capitalist economies, neoliberal ideologies. The enormous divisions of the past, which once broke the continent in half, began to dissolve. European integration seemed unstoppable. Peace reigned triumphant. Prosperity was on the horizon. As Fukuyama famously put it, with the end of history, the end of worldwide ideological struggle, the greatest danger ahead was boredom. Let's fast forward 30 years to the year 2019. Things look a little different. Instead of prosperity, Europe has experienced years of austerity, economic volatility, and uneven growth. And another recession may be around the corner. Instead of unity, powerful nationalist movements now agitate against the European Union. Instead of peaceful interstate relations, sharp regional tensions have erupted again with Russia once more viewed as an expansionist adversary. Instead of stability, Europe is now gripped by widespread discontent, mass protests, a new wave of combative social movements. Instead of cherishing the freedom of movement as the great symbol of liberty, many today see it as the greatest threat to freedom. Instead of tearing down walls, Europeans are now building more of them. In fact, since the fall of the Berlin Wall, Europe has constructed over 1,000 kilometers of border walls, many of them after 2015. Instead of boundless optimism in a better future, an impending climate crisis has left many in Europe wondering if there will even be a future at all. Most importantly, if the early 1990s saw the end of acute ideological competition, the present is defined by an all-out struggle between competing visions of the future. Once again, Europe is home to a cacophony of ideologies, nationalism, separatism, socialism, anarchism, fascism. In countries like Spain, regional separatism is back. In Britain, democratic socialism is making a bid for power. In Germany, a new generation of Nazis vandalize Jewish cemeteries or block buses of immigrants chanting, we are the people. In Poland, once a symbol of a resistance to oppression, white nationalists now chant, pure Poland, white Poland. In Eastern Europe, some now claim that life was actually better under communist rule with a few going so far as to glorify dictators like Stalin. As a sign of this remarkable shift, none other than Francis Fukuyama himself, a one-time neoconservative on the Reagan administration's payroll, has recently declared that socialism ought to come back. Life comes at you fast. <laughs> I think history is back, and with a vengeance. Why did this happen? How did we get here? What are we to make of our present situation? Well, I only have about 10 minutes left, so I can't offer a detailed explanation here. But I would like to end with a few thoughts about how we can begin to think about what has happened. First, we should not see the last 30 years as a kind of fall from grace. 1989 was not the pure triumph of liberty many people thought at the time. In fact, some of the seeds of the present crisis 
can be found in the tumultuous events of that year. The rapid reunification of Germany did not produce harmony, but exacerbated divisions between West and East. Uh, up here, you can see on the left a map of West and East Germany. And uh, on, the, on the right, you can see an election map illustrating the performance of the right-wing party alternative for Germany in 2017. Uh, you can see the party is doing quite well in former East Germany. There are a number of reasons for this, but one of them has to do with the very abrupt reunification process, which left many East Germans bitter. The breakneck expansion of free market capitalism into the East might have benefited some, but it harmed others. In Russia, for example, shock therapy, shock therapy allowed an oligarchy to seize public assets. Unemployment rose from almost zero to 30% in just three years. And male life expectancy dropped from 66 to 58 by the end of the decade. The decision to push NATO deep into the former Soviet world while failing to integrate Russia politically, economically, and militarily has left many Russians resentful, fueling the rise of Vladimir Putin. The wave of revolutions certainly cast off oppression, but it also unleashed a very ambiguous kind of nationalism, at times emancipatory, but at other times descending into kind of violent, virulent ethno-nationalism as the events in Yugoslavia would show. Despite the rhetoric of equality, the revolutionary events of those years failed to provide lasting structural solutions to deep inequalities. In short, quite a few of the major issues that Europe faces today can be traced directly back to the way 1989 unfolded. But just as we shouldn't pretend that everything was perfect in 1989, we also should not assume that it was the source of all of our troubles, that the end was somehow already foretold in the beginning. And this brings me to my second point. There wasn't one single moment where it all went wrong. Instead, I think we are dealing with the effects of an accumulation of small cracks, each one amplifying the next, the Iraq War, the Great Recession, the Greek debt crisis, movement of the squares, parliamentary success of the far right, migration crisis, terrorist attacks, Brexit. I don't have time to get into the details here, but each of these contingent effect, events and many others shifted expectations and challenged assumptions in every sphere of life, economics, geopolitics, identity. Each small crack has deepened the ones that came before with all the breaks fusing in unexpected ways to create a kind of multi-layered crisis. This leads to the third point. We should understand our time as one of crisis. By this, I do not simply mean an economic downturn. In my view, a crisis is that which reveals the limits of the existing order, shakes old assumptions, and challenges ways of life that many of us took as immutable truths. The old world is burst open, creating an opportunity for new alternatives. Of course, crisis does not mean terminal collapse. I am not suggesting we should all take to the hills or something. I'm just saying that a crisis is a period of reordering, a moment when the old ways have hit their limits, when the field is blown wide open for new paths. Fourth, we should keep in mind that there have been crises like this before, in the 1890s, the 1930s, in the 1970s. Each time the existing order was shaken and a new configuration took its place. The crisis of the 1970s, for example, gave rise to a new Western European order based in free market capitalism, conservative values, and aggressive foreign policies. But while we've had crises before, each one looks a little different. One of the biggest differences today is that the political coordinates of the past have been thoroughly scrambled. The language of left and right, which we have inherited from the French Revolution, is barely comprehensible to us now. Let me give you a few examples. First, Brexit. This is, strictly speaking, neither a left nor a right issue, but one that cuts across the spectrum. There are people on the right who support it because they want greater independence, security, and control. But there are also people on the left who support it 
largely because they feel the EU leadership would make any kind of socialist transition in Britain impossible. Let's take another example. Many of the big far-right parties in Europe today are embracing ideas that were once anathema to the right. In France, far-right politician Marine Le Pen has earned significant support from young women by positioning herself as a champion of women's rights, creating a kind of feminism of the far-right. In the Netherlands, the Party for Freedom has rallied around LGBTQ rights, presenting itself as the great defender of European values against intolerant Muslim immigrants who would trample on all cherished Western freedoms. In Germany, one of the leaders of the far-right alternative for Germany is a lesbian mother. We are not dealing with the old interwar fascism, but something different. Final example, the recent Yellow Vest movement in France, which some of you may have heard about, breaks with all the traditional features of a leftist social movement. It is not based in youth, students, or organized workers. Its political demands are all over the place, and its members hail from all sides of the political spectrum. Anarchists, liberals, white supremacists, libertarians, communists, French nationalists. It is impossible to say whether this is politically right or left, or if you should just go buy Bitcoin. Don't know. <laughs> I think this is partly why today's crisis seems so bewildering. We lack many of the traditional coordinates to anchor our analysis of what's happening, forcing us to reinvent a kind of political language on the spot. Lastly, I think it's worth emphasizing that today's crisis is unfolding on a planetary level. I have spoken primarily about Europe, which is my area of research, but I think we are seeing very similar trends elsewhere in the world, especially right here in the United States. This is in large part because many of the causes of today's crisis are so transnational in nature. Trade, migration, climate change, these are all global issues. Climate change in particular has had a dramatic effect. It is not only supercharging all other elements of the crisis, like migration, it has created a kind of apocalyptic urgency that people living through prior crises may not have felt. The stakes are very high. Where we go from here, I'm not sure. But I do know that a great deal depends on the young generation. Bowdoin students, you are the children of crisis. You are living through truly remarkable and unprecedented times. What you do today and in the coming years will have an enormous impact on what happens. Good luck. Salar, that was fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. This is what goes on at Bowdoin. Remarkable. Both of you, thank you. I'd like to offer some final congratulations to our Phi Beta Kappa, Book Award recipients and Sarah and James Bowden Scholars on all of their outstanding academic accomplishments. I'd like to thank George Lopez, our Beckwith artist in residence, once again for uh, gracing us here today, George. Thank you. Immediately following this ceremony, there will be a reception in the Drake lobby, which is down in the lower level of, the, uh, of this building, and I hope you will all join us. Um, George will be uh, joined now by Ayana uh, Harris-Coet and Brianna Cunliffe, from, uh, Bri uh, Ayana from the class of 2021, and uh, Brianna from the class of 2022 to lead us in the singing of our alma mater. I would ask you if you are able to please stand. Uh, you'll find the words on the back of your program. 
And I would ask you to remain standing until the processional has left the theater.